I think in an API world, it's actually easier than most to come to non-zero-sum conclusions because like we're offering a service, folks are ideally receiving value from that service and, all, and then we get to learn from that and develop new things. Yeah, so I think thinking about most interactions in that way, there doesn't need to be a winner and a loser, leads to, to a shift in, in how we build things. I think expectations are certainly changing in terms of like what what's going to be expected and, and obviously like with these technological advances there are certainly opportunities available to find areas to, to streamline things. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. My name is Laura Vash and I'm going to be your host today. I work at Pronovis Developer Portals uh, and uh, I'm also usually the host of the API The Docs uh, conferences and this podcast. Our guest today is Anthony Picciardo. He's a product manager supporting the Visa developer platform and community. We know Anthony from uh, the Dev Portal Awards, where Visa has nominated over many years and took away many, many awards. So thank you for coming and welcome. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. I understand that it's since 2016 that the platform uh, team, uh, the developer platform team is running, or the platform itself is already running since 16. Yeah, so we, we launched the platform in, in 2016, and yeah, it's been going since then. And you've been uh, you've been working on this uh, Visa developer from, from the get-go, or did you, when did you join? So I joined in 2021. Uh, so I've been with the team for a little over two and a half years now. And then let's roll back the time a little bit. So where are you? Where are you coming from into this role, and and what brought you here? Yeah, totally. It's, it's kind of an interesting uh, career journey, a little bit. So came out of college with a computer science degree and joined Bank of America Merrill Lynch as a as a software developer. Uh, so spent a few years in, in the kind of a development role, and through that experience, learned that I kind of wanted to move towards product. Uh, so I spent some time, uh, I joined a research lab as, as a technical lead, looking at system dynamics and then community engagement. Uh, and through that experience, developed more like the, the ability to kind of write requirements, better understand users and, and some standard practices there. Uh, and after that, joined Visa as our uh, community lead and also the, the product manager for the user experience with the development mm -hmm. So that means that your inner drive or have always been uh, both people and technology focused at the same time. Yeah, I think the intersect intersectionality is uh, super interesting to me and it, it kind of drives a lot of the work that I do. So you were first joining the community uh, side of the Visa Developer Program. What did that mean for you from the beginning? What were you busy with and, and where did that evolve into at this point? Yeah, I was spending a lot of time with user research, understanding the folks that were using the platform. Uh, like in having sort of those like direct interactions with, with the folks that are developing using our APIs. And so going through the surveys, uh, this was during the COVID time, so we didn't have our like, typical meetups anymore, uh, but still like web interactions, having video calls and trying to get close to understanding like the pain points that folks were dealing with and then bring back that information to the product team and, and developing new experiences for our platforms, but based on what and what happened uh, or how did it happen that you then also also joined the product team? Yeah, I think there was an, an opportunity within the team to kind of step up and, and guide more of that direction on the product, so especially given my own technical background and like the, the understanding of like how the platforms work. So sort of leveraging that in my past experience and, and wanting to continue to explore in, in that way and, and develop, there was room for me to grow and, and greatly just my managers they, they bring the opportunity and went for it. Who are your colleagues? How big is this team that you're working with? Our core team focused on user experiences is about three or four people, but the expanded team that supports like the end-to-end -end experience of going from implementation to uh, like support is probably around 40 people. Does that mean that you're um, in like daily contact with the documentation team too? Yeah, absolutely. So, so they're they're part of our core team, and our individual product teams support their their products documentation. So we'll meet with them maybe weekly, but our team will support like standards and, and overall like look and feel the site, and then maintain that. So you said you joined in twenty twenty one. That's you were referring to that. that that's kind of a tough time to jo <laughs> to join as a community manager. Um, 
Did something significantly change since then? Before we set up the call here, you said that you're calling in from California. Did life restart? Uh, do you have a lot of meetups now? Or, or how does this look like to be a community manager in 2023? I don't know if I can call you community manager, but you're very um, busy with the, the community-focused uh, aspects of this developer platform. Yeah, it's definitely a large part of my role. It's, my time is basically split 50-50 between the product side of things and the community side of things. So I think it's still a, a, a fair a fair title to give. Things have definitely changed. We're back in office roughly 50% of the time. There's definitely been a lot more opportunities for us to connect with at least the folks that are local to us. Obviously, economically, things are a little tougher now, so there's not a lot of travel happening. Um, but there's still a lot of opportunities for folks like get out and then there seems to be a lot more excitement within the, within the space of folks wanting to meet up and, and go to hackathons and, and do these live events again. So it's been good to have those interactions. I presume it's mostly developers who are engaging with the platform. Do you see other roles uh, coming up uh, maybe that you didn't expect to engage with um, the API um, portal or roles that didn't exist before? Yeah, actually, it is pretty interesting. So, so we do a survey every year to kind of get, get a pulse of who the folks are that are, that are using the platform. It's roughly like 70-30 split developers and the other 30% being business folks, sales folks, uh, marketing partners, just trying to like get a better understanding of like what the landscape looks like. So we do get a good mix of, of other like user types that, that come. The specific part of where you work is that it's such a highly regulated environment, uh, very much based on security and observability. Now, I saw on the developer platform, it's, it's very interesting how reassuringly it comes up from beginning to end that once you uh, think you're ready to actually make this application live, our team is going to guide you through both in the constraints of what you have to live up to and in how to actually make this go live. And that that sort of explicit promise for handholding, um, I don't know how you pulled that off in the background, but it feels very reassuring to see that on the platform. But what is behind it? What kind of documentation, let's call it that way, did you have to put together to be able to relieve this handholding team from doing everything and explaining everything. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Uh, and I, I don't envy the folks that are on that side because it is it, it, there is a lot of trust involved and there, there's risk involved. So, so folks need to be very careful over there. But on our side, to kind of ease that, ease that burden, it's a lot of bringing to light early the types of information that's going to be needed from our clients from like a compliance perspective. If you want to use a certain product, you, you need to meet this set of standards or you're going to get shut down early. That compliance lens and focusing on how do we get in front of the users everything that they need to know prior to these engagements uh, takes some of the burden off. Uh, and also the overall like implementation process, letting them walk through step-by-step -step everything that's going to be needed as they start to develop their application. Um, we've tried to put together guides and some interactive materials to help them uh, go through that journey. And also just leveraging our our community platform, the forums, folks are welcome to post and, and ask their questions. And we try to be responsive there. How did you build up the forum? So forums are always risky business uh, because it can so easily become a haystack. But at the same time, it's the most empowered, autonomous. I have this very specific question. See, someone help me. How did you build that up? Well, the, I'm talking more about like mapping it, the discoverability and findability of things in the forum. How, how does that come about? How do you steer that? Totally. Uh, so the forum is broken up into sections, both by product type and also like where you are in your user journey. Uh, so folks that are new to the platform haven't necessarily like launched a project yet. Uh, you can just go to like the, the, the welcome section or the getting started section and ask the questions there, or just search through the, the archive of questions that, that have already been answered to, to kind of find a quick response um, without having to post themselves. And then for folks that are kind of more entrenched in, in the process, they can break down their questions by product type and, and go down that that path, to sort of ease that journey and make it a little bit easier to find the the needle in, in that haystack. Who is the shepherd of the forum in the team? Yeah, I guess there's there's kind of three main players on, on our side. Um, myself is thinking about like user experience, and like how we engage with the folks. Our moderation team that helps kind of filter out some of the spam and, and also ensure the folks are getting wrapped in the right place. And then uh, our like support staff that actively monitor and respond to questions and, and try to and try to get folks the answers they need. 
And it sounds like this is the minimum, right? Like don't even try a forum for uh, an enterprise as big as Visa uh, without this in the background. It would be incredibly tough and you would be spending, a, you'd be pushing a, like a 60, 70 hour work week with anything less. I understood that you have uh, recently rolled out a new way of discovering things through arranging information on, a, on the portal through um, capabilities, if I recall correctly. Uh, where are your eyes now? What are you working on now? Is there as a team and or uh, personally, where, where are you pushing things right now? Yeah, I guess as a team, there's kind of two main areas of focus. One being on sort of that discoverability and helping users find the products and the use cases or I guess products that they're looking for. And secondarily, our like overall like onboarding journey and how do we sort of streamline that and, and ease some of the the lags that exist there. Because uh, it does take a, a decent bit of time to get to go to production with our products because of all the compliance, because of all the steps involved within integration and testing. But there's always areas for for efficiencies that we can identify. On the discoverability piece, a lot of that's focused on thinking about the core use cases that our clients are coming to the platform to build. Um, so instead of just looking at our portfolio of product products individually, how do we bundle these into the actual functionality that folks are trying to deliver and kind of restructuring our site in that way? And sometimes it, it means leading folks away from the developer center into the partnership portal or in the other number of like services that these offers that could better meet the client's need. Do you see some 4C or foreshadow, some fundamental change in how onboarding and discovery is going to work. And I'm seriously not trying to, 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 to steer you towards AI. I know you will not be able to avoid that, but um, do you see some sort of um, paradigm shift in the way humans approach this? Or would you like to see one? Yeah, I think expectations are certainly changing it in terms of like what what's going to be expected. And, and obviously like w with these technological advances, like there is certainly opportunities available to to find areas to, to streamline things and i think even with like in the onboarding journeys uh, the like aml and risk checks that that go through in the financial services industry um a lot of that can is going to get faster and better and, and both more rigorous but less to less time and invasive uh for users through the use of like these new platforms and kind of all this cloud-based data being connected and not on the technology side, but in the way people think about this. Do you see something shifting? Yeah, I think there's almost almost two schools currently. With, with like, if you think about open banking and like wanting everything to be available, um, and it, like in, at, kind of at hand quickly, and folks owning more of it and less of that ownership coming to Visa, um, right? Or I guess like other players like us. And then it, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum is like wanting everything to be tightly secured and a lot of trust and reliability that there won't be fraud involved. So there's kind of this almost, it's almost like polarizing in, in some ways that like you need to think about both ends of the spectrum and and, ins and ensure that for folks. Mm -hmm. And how do you navigate that? And if you have any insight into how does the docs team navigate that, I think I think I would be very interested in that too. Yeah, totally. I, I think that the answer is maybe one and the same. And, it, and it's a lot of I guess like user-centered design and empathy for the folks that, that are using the platform and understanding what their core use cases are and, and staying true to that as we both develop our documentation and build out our, our product. You kind of think about them as almost two, two separate personas. So for the folks that are using where the use case falls under one or the other, you kind of cater it differently and then think about like their, their implementation journey slightly separately from each other. You mentioned before that you would really want to be talking about the importance of framing and, and minimizing the learning curve for users. And you just talked about uh, user research that you use, uh, that you do a, a lot and, and follow up their journeys. But we're talking about the Visa developer platform here. <laughs> so um, there's not necessarily a lot of restrictions uh, qua what can be what can be created that I think you want to build in. So how do you go about that as a uh, product manager? Yeah, I think the phrase that I always recite to myself is is, is is simple but not simplistic. So minimizing some of that learning burden while 
keeping the, like a, a high level of detail and, and making sure that we're not like leaving out anything. I guess one of the ways to to leverage that is through frames and and building upon the things that we know our users already understand and, and relating that to our own product sets and, and building things in a way that like it, it adhere to standards or best practices that are, are industry wide. And then for folks that are coming to the platform, it does ease that journey of like, oh, okay, yes, this is an, a new technology set. Yes, it's complicated, but it's related to this. I understand that. I've done this before. And through that, it, it kind of makes things a little bit easier for them. And and obviously just responding to their feedback and then uh, resetting those frames in our mind as we learn new things. That would mean basically constantly reiterated how is the onboarding worded? How does that happen? How do you keep reiterating towards the raising bar of shared understanding among your average users? It's certainly not a stupid question. It, it, it absolutely is easier said than done. I guess it's just recognizing that, yes, it is hard, but that there is value in it and, and placing it as a priority. So, and so kind of leveraging our, like we have tons of folks on the user research side of things uh, that, can, that can be actively engaged with folks and, and getting that feedback and helping us understand like, where is that bar currently? And then bringing that back to us. And, and for us, it's it's looking at our documentation, although it's, I guess, with something like 80 plus products on the platform and, and leveraging the kind of the, the overall ecosystem to think, okay, what, what based on this new feedback, what do we need to change? What do we need to be looking at? And obviously with these like, with generative AI, there is going to be a, a massive frame shift and like what our users are going to be expecting. And you're already kind of seeing some sort of like pilot things come out where this is what the future documentation is going to be, I guess that that's going to be the new bar. So that'll that'll dictate a lot of change and we'll have to and we'll have to respond. Do you also perceive the need for more non-text content or not yet? As in exploring the content for integration through an AI agent will require text. Whereas I've been hearing it from from other teams that they feel the need for non-text content as keenly as they feel the need to serve AI agents. Do you see that too or not yet? Yeah, absolutely. Do you mean in terms of like uh, like demo applications and sort of like some of this like, uh, I guess, more interactive, like the high touch, uh, I mean, like, like actual physical touch interactions? Anything, everything. I'm wondering where you are, uh, where you are seeing the, let's put it harshly, the ROI of breaking out of only serving information requests in text. Visa as a company is built around partnerships and engagements, not just through the web, but through I mean, like truly like high touch, like phone calls at times or like in-person interactions or um, so that could look like videos and trainings in that way um, or, or like a, a genuine phone call to the client. I think that happens all the time. Um, and then building out these, as we build out these models, I think there will be an expectation that not everything is like, a response that I need to go read through. It could be, you just serve me what I need uh, at that point. Mm -hmm. And this is already trickling into API integrations needs to, or not yet? Um, it certainly is. I think and this isn't necessarily happening here at Visa, but I think folks have seen what, what Stripe's done with uh, with Microsoft's partnership there and, and already adding ChatGPT in, into their documentation. Uh, and so some of that like code generation that comes from it is has been incredible. Like I think it's kind of shot the wall a little bit to see that happen so quickly. Where are you pushing the portal now? What depth or new direction are you steering it towards? If that is public. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I can uh, I can chat about a few things. That one of it is that discoverability piece, and and also kind of trying to bridge the gap between our ecosystem. So Visa obviously is, is a, a massive organization, and, we've, and then we've made some acquisitions over the years. Um, that have their own developer portals. So how do we identify the opportunities of like where folks should be leveraging products across our ecosystem um, and making that journey a little bit a little bit more seamless is, is something we're, we're certainly focused on. Where does community play a role in that? I think it's a, it's actually going to be a, a core tenet of it in that community and the, the folks that are involved there can help guide that direction of what are the the platforms that do intersect um and, and like what what are our users using um across cyber source visa 
tank from from Europe um, and the rest of the, the platforms and kind of helping us think about, I, I'll, I'll bring it back to building out a frame, but this new model of the ecosystem, because it doesn't necessarily mean that every platform's connected. It means that there's a, there's there's subsets that are connected and there's, a, I guess, like concentric circles. You wrote something very interesting uh, when we asked, uh, what is the what is the conclusion that you want to want to arrive to? And you brought in a very fancy word um, or expression uh, that you're very keen on building non-zero sum environments. Can you go into that? How does that look like for you? What is a non-zero sum environment when it comes to API integrations? Yeah, it's it's where we both went. Uh, and folks kind of leave uh, leave the interaction or, or wrap up a, an engagement with us, feeling that they've benefited, and then so do we. Um, and a lot of that comes from both the feedback they, that they give us and also, I mean, the value that we're delivering through our, our products and solutions. Uh, I think in an API world, it's actually easier than most to come to come to non-zero sum conclusions because like we're offering a service, folks who are ideally receiving value from that service and, all, and then we, we get to learn from that and develop new things. Um, yes, yeah, so I think thinking about most interactions in that way, there doesn't need to be a winner and a loser uh, leads to to a shift in, in how we build things. And uh, so I try to, to bring that in the most interaction that I carry. Where is your heart right now around documentation? Where do you think there isn't a clear demand for something, but you would love to see something done differently? Yeah, I think a lot of what I think about, and I, I, can, I can be open here and admit that I struggle to, to know the solution for, is the level of granularity that's required to for a developer or a user to simply implement a solution. You go through these documentation sites, whether it's Visa or someone else, and it, and it is pages upon pages upon pages of stuff. And it's dense. It's not easy material to, to just kind of read through and fly through. So I think I think a lot about that. How do you make that feel more like a, a Dr. Seuss book and, and sort of make implementation a little bit easier? I have a lot of empathy for our developers that, that have to trudge through it all and, 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 then, and find the, the nugget that they're looking for in a given day. Is there a question that you would like the people listening to keep thinking about a bit? Yeah, I think that the question that I'd, I'd like to ask most folks is, or maybe maybe it's more of a challenge: is can, how do we identify ways to make API implementation simpler, whether that's through low code SDKs, web apps? I think the integrations can be done differently. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to look towards that and, and figure out more streamlined approaches to offering services. Thank you, Anthony, for being our guest here. And I'm looking forward to uh, the developments that the portal is going to come up with and innovations, especially around no code, low code. That's uh, super, super interesting for me too. So thank you again. Thank you. This, this is amazing. And I, I continue to look forward to the, the thought leadership that comes out of your program and uh, the events you host. Thank you. Uh, we aim to serve and hoping to share the collective knowledge because there's a lot we just need to be able to share it somehow. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, apidadocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.